Hey there, welcome back. Episode two of the Higher Up Podcast. If you're here for the second time, I appreciate it. If you haven't listened to episode one, that's a recap of my ultra marathon. I'd appreciate it if you go listen. Today, we're going to be talking about what I believe in my experience to be the five most powerful levers you can pull for a successful fat loss phase or a diet. I don't love the term diet. I prefer to look at diet in phases and look at the way we eat as our nutrition or our way of eating. Diet implies a means to an end, but in a fat loss phase, we intend for that not to be forever. I like the term lever because I believe they are leverages that we can pull to increase our leverage against the calorie deficit, which is inherently challenging at times. But these are five tools that I'm going to share with you that I believe make dieting easier. They have made it easier for me. Some of this is backed in scientific research, which I'll talk through in detail. And it's worked for hundreds, probably thousands of other people at this point. So the levers I'm going to be talking about with you today, first and foremost, is going to be protein, food volume, water, movement, and sleep. Now, these aren't in order of importance. Maybe I shouldn't say first and foremost for, for protein. They are in the way that they occurred in my brain and that I wrote them in my notes. So if you see me looking down, I'm referencing some notes that I have on my laptop in front of me, which you can't see. It's just me and you. And I'm going to talk through these. So we're going to start with protein and then go into food volume and then go into movement and hydration as well as sleep. I don't know if I mentioned water. So those are the five levers. So let's get into it. Number one, the first lever you can pull when you're in a fat loss phase or trying to lose body weight, body fat that is, is protein. Why? Simply put, protein is the most satiating macronutrient. I had somebody try to tell me it was fat. Somebody said that it was carbohydrates. No, it is protein. Couple reasons. Number one, there's plenty of research to back the fact that when subjects in these studies consumed more protein, they consumed less total calories and lost body weight as a result because protein fills us up. Protein also has what's called a very high thermic effect of food. That is the energy it takes for us to digest the food that we eat. Everything we do takes energy. What I'm doing right now is burning calories. My brain burns calories. My hands moving burn calories. Digesting food burns calories. You are literally a calorie burning machine. So when we look at thermic effect of food, we look at it in the three macronutrient profiles, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. Protein comes in at the highest thermic effect of food at about 15 to 20%. What does that mean in plain English? It simply means that if you eat 200 calories from pure protein, your body will burn somewhere between 15 and 20 calories just digesting and assimilating that protein. So when you eat a high protein diet, one, 200, 300 grams of protein a day, you can actually increase your metabolic rate slightly because your body is burning more energy just to di digest that protein. Protein is what I recommend everybody start their day with or have their first meal with. I like intermittent fasting, but you don't have to intermittent fast to lose body fat. But my rule is if you're going to eat breakfast, it's 50 grams of protein minimum or nothing. Skip it, hydrate, caffeinate, have your first meal around lunch. Protein also builds more muscle, obviously. Most people just aren't getting enough protein. I don't care what you say. I've talked to a lot of people at this point in the coaching community that came on as a, co a client or were looking to be coached by me or just conversations. A lot of you just aren't aware of how much you're consuming and you're probably not consuming nearly enough. I don't care what your nutritionist says. 0.4 grams of protein per pound is not enough. If you want to build muscle, you want to burn body fat, and you're in the gym working out two to four times a week, you need more protein. That 0.4 gram per pound RDA is from the Food and Drug Administration, which I already don't really trust. So I recommend per the research, anywhere from 0.8 to 1.2 grams per pound of body weight. I like to keep it easy and simple. If, if you followed me on TikTok for a little while, you know I like one gram per pound. I'm 190 pounds. I eat 190 grams a day minimum. Now, if you have more than 50 pounds to lose of body fat, you go by what's called maybe your lean weight or your goal weight. So whatever you think you'll look like lean with abs, more fit, eat that much in grams of protein. So if you're 250 pounds, but you want to be 180 pounds, I want you to eat 180 grams of protein per day. It's just a good way to keep it simple. You can vary that a little bit. You can be on the 0.8 side. You can be on the 1.2 side and eat a little more. There's really no adverse effects that we've seen in research. Subjects have consumed up to, I think, four grams per kilogram of body weight, which is like two grams per pound of body weight in protein, and have observed no adverse effects on the kidneys, so no adverse renal function, which everyone says is what's going to happen. No. Uh, if anything, they just got full easier and they consume less calories. So up your protein intake. When I'm dieting, I like to eat as much as 250 grams of protein in a day. I feel better. I recover better, especially being in that deficit, not having the energy that I need 
in the calorie surplus when I'm in the gym, I feel better eating more protein. What kinds of protein sources might you ask? I'm glad you asked. I like to go for animal protein first and foremost for a couple of reasons. One, it's very nutrient dense. Two, it's very bioavailable to the body. It is the most bioavailable protein source that we know of. Animal protein like red meat, I'm privy to red meat because it's higher in micronutrients than a chicken, um, but red meat, steak, lean ground beef, you're choosing chicken, fish, whole eggs, that's a great one. 90% of my diet is red meat and whole eggs in terms of protein sources. Now you can tap into protein shakes as a lever you can pull to get more protein. I'm absolutely not opposed to that. If I had to choose a protein type, I would say a whey protein or an animal protein source. Why? Because animal protein has the highest leucine content. And from what we can see, leucine seems to be driving the ship for muscle protein synthesis, which is the building of new muscle tissue. Leucine is an amino acid. And there was an interesting study done where they had subjects consume 50 grams of an animal protein and 50 grams of, I believe it was a wheat and corn protein or soy protein maybe. And those wheat and corn proteins were not anywhere near the leucine threshold of, I believe it's two grams of leucine per serving. When the subjects consume the animal protein and the plant-based proteins in equal amounts, they saw a substantial impact in protein synthesis only in the animal protein group. But when they added the leucine, pure leucine to the plant proteins, they saw the same muscle protein synthesis response. So ultimately, leucine profile is going to be the most important piece, it seems. And if you don't want to worry about which plant protein has the most leucine, which one should I go with, should I supplement leucine, just eat animal protein. Consume whey protein shakes, eat red meat, eat chicken, eat whole eggs. You'll cover your bases, okay? So protein is incredibly important for building muscle and regulating appetite. It's also going to be a really useful tool to regulate your hunger cues. Most people aren't hungry. They're having a craving. And a good way you can ask yourself this question and sort of audit your hunger cues and your appetite is, would a grilled chicken breast sound good? Or could I just eat a plate of ground beef? If the answer is no, if you're not craving whole foods and protein, you're probably not really physiologically hungry. You're just having a craving. So have some water, go for a walk, and just keep moving. I love protein for that reason. If it's not protein and you're not craving it, you're probably not really hungry. So that is one of my favorite levers to pull in a diet phase, and that is lever one, which is protein. Really quick, I want to interject here. Any questions you have in the comments, anything you want to see me cover in future episodes around fitness, nutrition, and mindset, or just anything in general, I'm happy to answer. Drop a comment. And also, please, if you're still here right now, like the video and subscribe to the channel. I'm working my tail off to try to grow this channel, and your feedback matters. So give me the good feedback, the ugly feedback, everything in between, and just interact with the video because it's super helpful to me. Let's get into lever number two, which is food volume. This one is massively important, and I believe it's one of the easiest levers you can pull to make a diet phase more enjoyable, especially if you're a former fatty like me. I have a big appetite. I like to eat a lot of food. I was a chunky monkey my whole life, and when I understood that I can eat a ton of certain foods for a very low hit on my calorie intake, dieting got a whole lot easier for me. What does that look like? It's important for a couple of different reasons. Your body signals your fullness, your satiety. That's a word I'm going to use a lot, satiation or satiety. Your body signals that fullness from a couple of different cues. It uses hunger hormones, leptin and ghrelin, which I'll get into in the sleep portion of this video in a few minutes. But it also uses the stretch receptors in your stomach. Your stomach expands to a certain quantity. The receptors activate, release leptin, tell your brain, hey, we're full, stop eating. So... High volume foods are going to activate those stretch receptors. Really easy example for this. If you have a food scale at home, this is a fun experiment I like to put people through that blows their minds. I want you to weigh out two servings of almonds. Now, I've been tracking and weighing food for a long time, so I happen to know that two servings of almonds is typically 56 grams, two ounces. It's typically 340 calories for just a plain salted almond. Now, that is about a, a handful of almonds. And nuts and fat sources are a way that people sabotage their diets all the time. I just have two or three handfuls of nuts a day and a few big meals. Well, you're having 800 calories of nuts, Jennifer, so relax. If you take that 340 calories of almonds and you sit it next to 340 calories of watermelon or pineapple or blueberries or broccoli, it's easily in the fruits and vegetables quality or category rather, four times the amount of food for the same caloric hit. And that is a huge lesson that you can learn. It's the same amount of calories, the same caloric hit, but it's so many more bites. And for you former fatties out there like me, I like to take lots of bites with my meals. 
So that is an easy change that you can make is adding more vegetables and more fruits. There's research that's been done when people add more voluminous foods, high volume foods in their diet, they tend to adhere to the diet better. So eat more high volume foods. Another piece of this is going to be really important for your health and longevity is your dietary fiber intake. It's also going to have a positive impact on your satiety. Plenty of research at this point has associated a high fiber intake with positive health outcomes. Most people aren't getting anywhere near enough. I believe the average American has between 5 and 15 grams per day. And it's estimated that our, our hunter-gatherer ancestors had somewhere between 100 and 200 grams of fiber per day. Now, that's insane. I would be glued to a toilet if I did that. But a good rule of thumb for you is for every 1,000 calories you consume, try to have 10 to 15 grams of fiber. It's great for your lower GI tract. It reduces your risk of colon and lower GI cancers. It's also going to slow down digestion because fiber takes a longer time to pass through our system. Slower digestion, more time full, more time created between meals, decrease in appetite. You tracking what I'm you picking up what I'm putting down here? More fiber, more voluminous foods. You're going to feel less hungry and less deprived on a diet. So a go-to meal for me, I just had it last night. I posted it on my Instagram story is 16 ounces of lean beef. I top that with avocado and pickled red onion and a little bit of raw honey. It's a salty, sweet, savory beef patty. It's freaking delicious. And I just bought one of those steam in bag uh, vegetables. It was broccoli and carrots. I steam them and then I toss them in a little bit of duck fat, oil of your choice. Not everybody has duck fat. I get that. Uh, and a little bit of Dano seasoning. Dano, sponsor me. I'm still trying. I will tag you every day on TikTok until you sponsor me, Dano. Anyway, season that up with the duck fat and then I throw it in the air fryer after I sort of par cook it. But you don't have to do that. I used to just steam them in the bag, put a little salt and butter on them, and I eat that big meal. And it's under, I think, 800 calories, 100 grams of protein. The red meat is high in micronutrients. Micronutrients are going to also help to regulate your appetite. It's probably something I could have stood to put on the list is micronutrients are important too. Sometimes when we're having cravings, we're, we're lacking or deficient in a vitamin or a mineral. So eating red meat, whole eggs, fruits and vegetables, supplementing with things like salt and magnesium, electrolytes can also help to regulate our appetite. Because most of the time, if we're just having random cravings for things we don't really understand, our body is typically yearning for something more. So getting a ton of those micronutrients in that meal, getting 100 grams of protein, getting dietary fiber, and just having a big meal, that thing kept me satiated up until today. I haven't eaten since 8 o'clock last night. It's almost 1 p.m. Eastern, and I'm still feeling good. So it's really important to prioritize food volume. Now, personally, if you've listened to me talk about my diet, I follow more of the animal-based protocol. I don't like to assign titles to diets, but whatever. I follow more of a red meat, whole eggs, fruit, rice, and potatoes. Vegetables, for whatever reason, they don't agree with my gut very well. Like last night, I had the broccoli. I had some bloating. I had some gas. I had some discomfort. That's just me. I've tried other things. I've tried different vegetables. For whatever reason, they're not great for me. So I'll eat them when I'm really hungry and I really want a big meal. It's okay. I'll, I'll take a little GI distress. That's okay. But I like to get most of my fiber from fruits and tubers, tubers being potatoes, and I'll have the occasional vegetable. But for most of you, you can probably tolerate vegetables. So eat your damn vegetables. The next piece of this I want to get into is water, water intake. You're not hungry. You're just dehydrated. It's something I say all the time in my videos and to the coaching clients in the community. Most people, again, just like protein aren't getting and fiber, just aren't getting nearly enough water. One thing I recommend in the morning, if you've, if you've listened to my morning routine video, is salt water in the morning. And no, I'm not talking about drinking the Pacific Ocean in your cup. What I'm talking about is a healthy pinch of salt in the morning mixed in with your water, about a liter. When you wake up and you say, I'm just so hungry. As soon as I wake up, I feel nauseous. I feel ravenous. I have to eat. No, you don't. We are not wired to eat as soon as we wake up, and we're not wired to eat throughout the day. If we did, we wouldn't store body fat on our guts, okay? And you would have no body fat on your gut, which you probably do. So one of the things I recommend is you're not hungry, you're just dehydrated. So have water with salt, which is an electrolyte. I use a pink Himalayan salt. You can use sea salt of your choosing. I don't like iodized table salt because it has preservatives and anti-caking agents, and it's just, why would I put that in my body? But water with salt tends to kill any hunger craving you may have because you're probably just dehydrated. You need the water to rehydrate your body and the salt, the electrolyte, to carry the water where it needs to go. Where sodium goes, water flows. So that's going to boost your blood volume a little bit, which is going to wake you up. It's also going to give your brain the electrolyte that it needs to work better. Our brain works on electrical charges. You've probably heard that. Electrolytes 
help to better conduct those charges in our brain and in our muscle tissue, which is why I also talk about salt as a performance enhancer for your workouts, but that's another video for another day. So have a morning salt water, have a salt water pre-workout and try to shoot for half your body weight in ounces in water throughout the day. I'm about, call it 200 pounds, I'm 190, but for easy math, I'm 200 pounds. I try to have at least 100 ounces of water a day. Not everybody needs a gallon of water, okay? That's a really blanket rule. Why would I, as a 190-pound guy, need the same amount of fluid as a 110-pound girl? That's silly. It's just a good way to pee all day and all through the night. So half your body weight in ounces, good place to start. Audit and adjust from there. Another thing you can do is have 16 ounces of water before each meal. If you find yourself being hungry, that's going to activate that stretch receptor reflex as well. It's also going to help fill you up more quickly, just like the fiber in the vegetables. So I always try to have two cups of water or one of these, which I wish I had filled up before I started because my mouth's getting dry. One of these before a meal, this is about a 20 ounce uh, shaker cup. And I crush that before a meal. And if you're still feeling hungry, have a little bit of water after. It's a cheat code. Last thing I'll say about water is definitely get a water filter. Don't drink tap water. It's dog shit. It's filled with all kinds of things. Tap water pipes are disgusting. It's just, don't do that. Buy, buy a decent water filter and drink filtered water. So that's water. Um, we're now going to move into movement. Movement is a big piece of this that people miss. I can't tell you how many people I have talked to that have said, I'm working out so hard in the gym and my diet's super clean, whatever that means. You can eat clean and still gain fat. Anyway, I'm eating super clean. I'm in the gym four days a week, five days a week, and I'm just not losing any weight. Okay, that's great. I'm glad you're doing those things. What are you doing with the other 12 to 14 hours you're awake? You're sitting on your ass, probably. There's 127 hours in a week. You need to find ways to build movement into the other parts of the day. Because if you're in the gym four or five days a week for an hour, that's only five hours a week of movement. If you're sitting at your desk the rest of your time, you're very sedentary. Your body's not burning a lot of energy. So you need more physical activity. How do we do that? Steps. It's very simple. Everyone I've ever asked about steps who isn't consciously tracking when we do track and they come into the coaching community as a client, I can see their steps in my app. They're at five to 6,000. We immediately up that to eight to 10,000 a day and the fat melts off of them. This is one of my favorite levers to pull. When I'm in a diet phase, I'm getting 15,000 steps a day minimum, sometimes 20. And honestly, I can eat whatever I want within reason if I'm doing 20,000 steps a day and lifting three to four times a week. My metabolic rate is so much higher. Depending on who you are, how big you are, how much muscle mass you have, 10,000 steps, each 10,000 step increment you add to your day can burn four to 600 additional calories on top of your total daily energy expenditure, which is all the, the calories you burn in a day. So that's what, 4,000 calories a week you could be burning? That adds up. That can really help to create a calorie deficit for you. And for me personally, I would always rather have more food and do more physical activity than have less food and do less physical activity. So I cut on 2,700 calories. When I start to plateau a little bit, I don't drop to 2,400. I just add in an extra two to 4,000 steps a day. Boom, the weight starts coming right back off again. So pull the step lever. Now, one thing I really like about walking specifically is it has a neutral effect on appetite. I know a lot of you have probably heard when you get in a cut, you gotta hop on the Stairmaster, you gotta do an hour of cardio, you gotta start running. And if you like those things, do them. I'm a big runner. You probably know this at this point. I do endurance running. I, I train for ultra marathons and marathons, but I don't do it for fat loss because running and hit cardio and Stairmaster is very glycolytic. It burns a lot of glycogen and carbohydrates. And when we come off of that exercise, our body wants to replenish that glycogen, triggering hunger cue. So you can actually overeat as a result of doing cardio, plus the dehydration from the sweat loss. Um, so I like to recommend walking for most people who are just trying to lose body fat. You don't have to be on a treadmill or a Stairmaster. Just pop outside and go for a walk. You're not going to get hungrier from it, and you're going to burn calories as a result. I also really like the health and wellness benefits of walking. Now, we know there's a research study that came out that showed subjects who walked eight to 10,000 steps a day, and I believe it was a meta-analysis of 500 people, had a 50% reduced risk of all-cause mortality, heart attack, heart disease, cancer, stroke, the things that kill us earlier than, than they should or, or get us eventually but get people later in life. 50% reduction just from walking eight to 10,000 steps a day because we were designed to move. So that's a great health and wellness and longevity benefit. 
Another thing I like about walking is the sense of peace and well-being that it brings when you walk more. I notice a direct correlation between my mental acuity and my sense of well-being when I walk more. The more I walk, the better I feel. And part of the, the theory behind this is it mimics a type of psychotherapy called EMDR therapy. I can't remember what the acronym stands for, but basically the belief, the principle of the, the system of EMDR therapy is moving the eyes rapidly back and forth creates a sense of calmness in our nervous system. Now, the evolutionary mechanism behind that might be when we're able to scan our environment, we're able to see that there are no threats, thereby the central nervous system moves into a relaxed rest and digest state. So I like walking because you organically do that. When you're walking, you scan your environment and that brings on a sense of calmness. So walking is a great lever to pull. If you're not hitting 10,000 steps a day and you're struggling to lose fat, please start walking 10,000 steps a day. I have a step-by-step -step guide. I don't care how busy you are. It's on my TikTok. You can build movement into your day. If you have 30 minutes in the morning, take a 20-minute walk or get out of bed 20 minutes earlier. If you have 15 minutes between meetings, pop out for a 10-minute walk two or three times a day. Take 10-minute walks after your meals. That has awesome impacts on insulin sensitivity, improving digestion, and overall positive health outcomes and weight loss. So if you find, if you start looking at your day in where do I build my day around my activity and not where do I scram, cram in movement in my already busy day? When you start to prioritize your activity and build your day around it, you can be a lot more successful. And it doesn't have to be all 10K steps in one rip. I like the 20 minute morning walk, three 10 minute walks throughout the day, and a 20 to 30 minute evening walk. That paired with your regular movement throughout the day, I promise you will easily be at 10,000 steps and the fat will start melting off. So get more damn walking. You also get sunshine, vitamin D, fresh air, better sleep. I could go on. I could rant, but I'm not going to, okay? So just freaking walk. Last lever. We're going to get into sleep now. Maybe this should have been at the top. I do believe it's the most important lever for health, wellness, fat loss, muscle gain, everything. We spend a third of our life doing it. Of course, it's important. So let's talk about sleep. Leptin and ghrelin, the thing I alluded to earlier, the hunger hormones that trigger our appetite and regulate our satiety are heavily influenced by your sleep quality. There is an inverse relationship between ghrelin and poor sleep. Ghrelin is the hunger hormone, so it is released when we are physiologically hungry. Leptin is the fullness or satiety hormone, and it's released when we're full or we get enough calories, energy, or food. When you sleep, on average, I think it was one night of five-hour or less sleep, so one night of acute sleep deprivation, has an acute impact on increased ghrelin levels. What does that mean? It means you're going to be hungrier, and you're not going to know why. So if you're sleeping like shit and you find yourself harder to make full or make satiated, it's probably because of your poor sleep. So stop doing that, okay? Please. I would appreciate it. It makes your life so much easier. Um, so when you're sleeping more, your leptin is regulated and your ghrelin is regulated. So you are able to get full more easily. There's an interesting sleep study that was done that I read that showed that people who averaged, I believe it was five hours of less or less per sleep of sleep per night over the course of a couple of weeks, on average consumed 400 extra calories per day. That is a lot. Just as a result of being underslept. Not sleeping well is a, a little bit like being drunk. It lowers our inhibitions. That's what one of the things that alcohol does. Inhibitions is our ability to make smart, wise, solid choices. So you're going to crave shittier food and you're more likely to give in to those cravings when you're sleeping badly. Another interesting study, now this was not done on as individuals who resistance trained, but this is alarming. Resistance training, weight training obviously helps us hang on to muscle, but a study was done on subjects who slept five hours per night and on average compared to their well-slept counterparts, they were all put in a calorie deficit. So they were all losing body weight, right? Because that's the main indicator. That's the driver of body composition change. The subjects who slept five hours or less per night lost 40% of their weight from lean mass. That's muscle, baby. That's muscle. So now is it going to be a little bit different if you're eating a bunch of protein and you're resistance training? Yeah, they probably didn't control for those in the study. But that being said, it sounds like if you're sleeping badly, you're shooting yourself in the foot and robbing Peter to pay Paul and probably losing more lean mass in the process. So if you're sleeping more, you're going to hang on to more muscle and you're going to have a regulated appetite. Win, 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 win. That's it. So sleep more. What's a good rule of thumb? What's a good amount of sleep? I'm going to say six to eight hours. Generally the recommendation. My sweet spot is seven, but if you're training hard, you're doing endurance training, your recovery needs may go up. 
So play around with it and see what works for you. But I feel fantastic when I'm averaging seven to seven and a half hours a night. Definitely try to get at least six. When you dip into the fives, you're looking at lower sense of well-being, increased anxiety, increased body fat, poorer choices, worse workouts. Another interesting study on sleep that I'll just randomly cite here because I'm a little bit ADD. They did a study on subjects. This is from Dr. Matthew Walker, one of the leading authorities on sleep. Read his book, Why We Sleep. If you haven't, it's fantastic. He did a study, and on after one night of acute sleep deprivation, subjects' force output and strength was reduced by 30%. Now, what does that mean in, in practicality in plain English? They did a study where they took these subjects into a weight training session and had them perform a movement that they could do for 10 reps, I think relatively close to failure. They then acutely sleep deprived them. I believe it was four hours and had them come back and perform the same exercise. And on average, they could only perform six to seven reps. So they were 30% weaker in the gym as a result of one night of bad sleep. That's just one night. Imagine some of you that are out here sleeping five hours a night for a year. Holy shit, that's not good. So sleep more and you'll work out better and you'll be more jacked. Simply put, how do we sleep better? I'll, I'll share some tips on this to close out the episode. And it is a couple of things. One, having a good sleep hygiene, sleep habits, uh, a nighttime routine. Our bodies and brains th thrive on habits and routines. So one of the things you can do is limit your blue light exposure a couple of hours before bed. We get blue lights from screens like the one I'm staring at now, our phones, our TVs. So stop the late night scrolling and put that shit away when it's time to go to bed. TikTok will be there tomorrow. YouTube will be there tomorrow. So will Netflix. It's not going anywhere. You're, you're shooting yourself in the foot. So limit your screen time in the evening. Another thing you can do is limit harsh light exposure in the evening. So my living room, t my living room overhead lights are very bright. They're sort of a white hue. I hate it. They're really aggressive. So in the evening, I have an orange light bulb uh, in a couple of lamps around the house, and I turn those on around 6.30 or 7 o'clock at night, and I get around the house through those. I'm not asking you to walk around through candlelight like a pilgrim, but you can buy these orange hue of lights on Amazon for 20 to 25 bucks. It's a no-brainer, and it emits orange light, not blue light, which can help our bodies release melatonin. We need the melatonin to sleep. Another thing you can do is wear blue light blocking glasses. I can, in my lenses here, I have built-in blue light block, but you can buy more aggressive orange tinted ones and mitigate some of the, uh, the damage from blue light in terms of your sleep quality. Another thing you can do is get that morning sunlight. You've all heard me talk about it at this point. Get morning sunlight on your eyes. That's going to align your circadian rhythm and help with the melatonin release that evening, 12 to 14 hours later. Get evening sunlight as well. There's some research to show that evening sunlight can actually offset some of the negative impacts that blue light exposure has on our brains in the evening. So go out, see the sunrise, go out, see the sunset, walk while you do it, get your steps in, two birds, one stone. See, this isn't hard. It's just about making four or five key decisions every day and you are skyrocketed towards your goals. So sleep hygiene, sleep habits, build a nighttime routine, limit your blue light exposure, cool the house down. Our body actually needs to decrease in temperature between one and three degrees to start the sleep processes such as melatonin release. So to do that, sleep in a cold room, add some blankets if you need to, but a cool room is critical for sleeping well. You've all tried to go to sleep hot. It's miserable. So cool the room down. This time of year, it gets cold as hell outside. I just crack a window and it's perfect. So a cool room, limit blue light block, or excuse me, limit blue light exposure in the evenings. Try blue light blockers, try orange light bulbs. And as far as supplementation goes, I love a few key sleep supplements. Now, Echo Vision, the t-shirt that I'm wearing right now, has a fantastic sleep supplement called Echo Z's. You can use the code HU for a discount on that sleep supplement. They have a powder, which I don't love. It tastes kind of shitty, um, but it has a bunch of great compounds in it, which are the ones I'm going to mention. They also have a pill uh, with the sim a lot of the same compounds that's, in my opinion, just easier to take. It's six caps. They're very small. I knock them back in one, one swig of water. But the supplements you want to look out for and include in your sleep regimen or routine is a magnesium, either a glycinate or a threonate. That's not three. That's not the number three, the letter O and Nate. It's T H R E O N A T E, magnesium threonate. If I had to choose on the spot one or the other, I prefer threonate. It more easily crosses the blood brain barrier and has shown some positive impacts on cognition. But glycinate is great too. This is just ma magnesiums bonded to different amino acids, glycine and threonic acid. So one of those two is fantastic for sleep and anxiety. It's estimated that up to 75% of the U.S. is deficient in magnesium. Now that number varies depending on who you talk to. Most people aren't getting enough and it is difficult to get even with a solid whole foods diet. It's high in leafy greens. 
It's high in uh, seeds. I don't eat a lot of those, so I need to supplement it. And when I increased my magnesium intake, even slightly above the RDA, I noticed lower anxiety levels, better sleep, better recovery. Magnesium is critical for so many processes in our body, and most people aren't getting enough. So magnesium glycinate or threonate is number one, first and foremost. At least buy that if you're not going to buy Echo Z's. Z's has magnesium glycinate in it. You can also get apigenin, which is the concentrated derivative of the sleep sleep promoting compound in chamomile tea. I have a supplement with apigenin and the next one I'm going to mention, which is L-theanine combined in one capsule. L-theanine is an amino acid that promotes the production of alpha brain waves. Alpha brain waves are associated with a sense of calmness and relaxation. So when I really want to knock out, I'll take my Echo Z's and I'll stack that with apigenin and L-theanine, even though it has a little bit in the supplement already, a little bit more helps that brain shut down. Now you can also supplement with things like GABA, gamma and butyrotic acid. That slows down the activity of our frontal lobe. It slows down the literal firing of the neurons in our thought thought factor here. So it can literally slow down a racing mind. Again, Echo Z's has everything that I'm saying, all of these supplements in one pill. So go grab it and use my code for a discount if you want. Um, so those are some of the supplements that I love. You can also take melatonin. From what we can see, there have been some studies done on mega dosing it or taking it daily for a set period of days. It doesn't seem like it reduces our body's ability to produce it. It is a hormone, so you would think that, but it seems that if we stop taking it the next day, your body will still produce melatonin when it's bedtime. So don't fear melatonin if you enjoy it. I take it a few nights a week, and it helps me drift off into sleep on days when my mind is racing. So those are the levers of fat loss. We have protein, we have food volume, we have water or hydration with electrolytes, salt, potassium, magnesium. Uh, we have movement building in your activity. Micronutrients is something that gets honorable mention. You need your macros, your protein, your carbs, your fat, but you also need your micros, your vitamins and your minerals. Um, and we've talked about sleep. So those are my favorite fat loss levers. If you can pull all of those, your dieting phase will be substantially easier. That's the episode. If you liked it, please like and subscribe to the channel. It really does help me out. If you didn't like it, let me know. I would appreciate it in the comments. I want all of your feedback, the good, the bad, the ugly. So I really appreciate you. If you're still here at 32 minutes in, drop a comment and say, we're still here. Uh, I'm going to keep up the trend from our previous podcast I had, the Fit Friend, Fat Friend podcast, and I'm going to keep the step checks up. So drop your step checks in the comments. It is 114 Eastern Standard, and I'm at 3,143 steps. So drop your step check in the comments. Let me know where you're at. If you're not at 10K for the day, go get it. Remember, it isn't easy, but it is simple. Do not overcomplicate it. Have a great day, everybody.